Let's bow in prayer for a moment. Father, this is a wonderful little book that you've given us, and I hope that it's been helpful to each of us in our walk with you and as a church. Pray you'd give us some wisdom right now on these verses so we can walk more closely with you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're really in some good days here. We have a Tuesday night, the Pie and Praise is going to be a lot of fun, uh, 6.30, right downstairs. Bring a pie or walk in with someone who's carrying a pie. <laughs> a little technicality there, you're in. So either way, you're in. And then, um, and then uh, Marty, is Marty downstairs? Yep, she's downstairs working nursery. And why is thumbs up that Marty's in the nursery? Oh, you're still on the pie thought. Okay. I'm like, wow, Marty's not here. And I'm like, that's a... <clears throat> Marty's making blackberry cobbler, isn't she? Because we're having Jesse and Debbie Boggs with us on Tuesday. They work with uh, folks down in Appalachian Mountains, and that is like an Appalachian like staple kind of dessert. So we have that as well. We have some fun holiday events coming up. It's a lot of fun things going on. But as we see the grace work through us, out of these short verses, I'm going to give you four signs, four signs that you are grace-filled. Because what Paul did, he talked all about it, but now he's just ending. And while he's ending his letter, he's showing himself. And we can see four things in his conclusion that he is. Four things about him which exemplify the message of grace. So, four things, four signs that you're full of grace. Do you guys know who Bill Envall is? The comedian? Yeah, some of you? Here's your sign, right? Okay. So, he was the one who came up that... Um, What's that group? Blue Collar? Blue? Comedy? You're the best. Thank you. <laughs> Blue Collar Comedy. Thanks for the help on that. Um, he's one of them, and his stick was, uh, he starts a joke, it's with a stupid sign. He says, stupid people should just wear a sign that says, I'm stupid. That way, you see it, and you don't ask him anything. So you say, excuse me, uh, oh, sorry, I see your sign. So here's some of his examples of that. It's, I stayed, uh, he said, I stayed late at work one night. Coworker came by and said, are you still here? And I said, nope, I left 10 minutes ago. Here's your sign, <laughs> right? Do you remember those? Remember these? So here's the one I pulled up to a dock in a little boat and lifted up a big old stringer of bass, and someone on the dock says, hey, do you catch all them fish? He said, nope, I talked them all into giving up. <laughs> here's your sign. Uh, here's one, one last one. Um, uh, pulling your car into uh, a gas station, and there is a flat tire, and attendant walks out and says, tire go flat? He goes, nope, I was just driving around, and those other three just swelled right up. Here's your sign. So what we're going to look at are five signs that you have grace in your life. Real simple. You have a relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. You've received his kindness and grace and forgiveness and love. And for those who have, these would be signs in your life. These are things that you would have. Take a look at the first one, verse 12. When I send Artemis and Tychicus to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. Simple little verse. Couple things. Artemis, no one knows who he is. There is no mention of him anywhere else. This is his one claim to fame. No one has a clue. The other one, not so much. There are five mentions of this guy. Tychus apparently was a pretty close friend of Paul. And he says, do your best. Like, there's an urgency here. Please, I really need you 
send Artemis or Tychus, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis because I'm wintering. I've decided to winter there. There's a little side note here. That lets us know it's not, he's not writing from prison. This is his own liberty. I've decided to do this. So this is in between some of his imprisonments that he writes this letter. And you see the very simple uh, task that he had is, I'm sending, I don't know who, Artemis or Tychicus, I'm sending them to you so that you can leave the island of Crete and go meet me at Necropolis, which is a little bit of a hub. Meet me there because I'm going to winter there so we can get our time together. Paul names over a hundred people in his letters. is that remarkable? There's 13 letters. He is dropping names right and left. Well, well, why would the Lord have that inspired by God naming people, many of whom we have no idea who they are? It does us no good to know that Artemis was one of the ones maybe being sent. So why are we knowing these things? It's clear that Paul was a team. This is a good example for us. It's part of a team. It's never one person. We attribute so much of the early church to, obviously, it's the disciples and then especially Paul where Paul would say, oh, are you kidding? Yeah, I led it, but probably off the top of his head he could name dozens and dozens of names of people that were critical. If not for, it wouldn't happen. Let's apply that to us as a church. The success of a local body is the involvement of the local body. A phrase that I've used over the, over the years, and I, I don't even know if I might be the only one that really gets this, but somebody will come to me and say, this is what we need to do. Uh, I, would, I want us to do whatever type of ministry, and my first, whether I say it out loud or not, my first thought is, we're not Rome. I'm not a pope. If God has called you to a ministry, my job, our job, is to empower, develop, equip, and unleash you to do it. It's a very important missed principle in the local church is priesthood of the believer is not just equal access to God, it's also equal mission. Think of that sentence for a second. We're regularly saying that we have equal access to God, priesthood of the believer, right? You can go directly to God through faith in Jesus Christ. You don't need a priest. You are the priest. You can go directly. Jesus Christ. You agree with that, right? So that's why we don't wear the collar backwards, although I'd think that'd be cool. I have one. Yeah, of course I do. We're at Halloween. But why don't you come to clergy to God? And you say, well, because God has called me through faith in Jesus, and you can go directly to the Heavenly Father in the exact same way that I do. Okay? If that's true, and it is, if that's true, you also have equal calling. God's called you to a mission. What is it? What is your skill set that is so unique? Nobody has the same talents and abilities that you have. Because you, you add everything to it, talents, abilities, personality, experience. You start adding these, nobody is like you. Paul is recognizing key people and saying, they are amazingly unique. They're amazing there. They're going to do this. 
and everyone is being unleashed. Ephesians 4 says the job of the pastor is to equip the people to do the work of the ministry. Too often we think the job of the pastor is to do all the ministry. And the truth is you have your own calling, and I don't want to limit it to here either. You and I should be filling every nonprofit in town, every compassion ministry in town. We're not going to selfishly say, you just need to do it all here for us. No, there are wonderful nonprofits in this town that need you to be involved, right? How many of you, on a fairly regular basis, even if it's twice a year, you do something with a local nonprofit? whether it's food or clothing or homeless or crisis pregnancy. How many of you part? Let me see. Oh, I love it. What's it say? Start your season soccer club. Oh, there you go. There you, of course it's going to be soccer. <laughs> of course it is. It's mentoring, helping young kids. That's critical for us because we're a team. So whether it's outside at a nonprofit of some sort or it's right here with us, you look at, um, uh, let's see, uh, Lisa, uh, over 300 boxes? 305. I'm going to say over 300 because that 305 boxes for uh, Operation Christmas Child. That is so good. That is so good. And you look at that ministry, if, if, Lisa depended on me to make sure that thing works, we'd have five boxes. Incomplete. Like ones that we can't even send. It'd be full of candy and weapons. And be like, I can't send that. But why is that ministry so good? It's because God's laid it on somebody's heart that says, this is something I'm going to do. And our job as a church is to just develop, equip, and give what's needed and go. And that's true of a small group that you may want to start and lead. That's true of a ministry, and they're endless, of the things that we could be doing don't wait for Rome. Don't wait for the, the church to say it. God's laid it on your heart, and together as a team is how we work ourselves to be effective in the community in which we live in. There are a lot of needs right now, by the way. And if you want to get more involved, I'd love to sit with you. Find out what you want to do. Not just to fill a gap. What do you want to do? What are you good at? And we find an area and then unleash you to do that. A grace-filled person, they work as a team. That's Titus 3.12. Look at the next verse, 13. Do your best to speed Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their way so that they lack nothing. There's some urgency here. We earlier said, do your best to, and now it's speed. Zenos the lawyer and Apollos. Apollos is mentioned a lot. Um, <clears throat> Zenos the lawyer, the question, what kind of lawyer? Probably based on Acts 18. There's a whole verse about this guy. He, he gets a whole verse. And it says that he does pretty good teaching people the law. It's a Mosaic law. So probably a lawyer, meaning an expert in the law of Moses, still not sure, though. It could be broader than that in some type of work in law. See that they lack nothing. So there's two that are swinging in through Crete, and they're on missionary work, and he says, hey, speed them along. Make sure they're not just waiting for supplies. Get them what they need and get them on their way. And literally says, see that they lack nothing. Be generous. Grace-filled people are generous. How generous are you? On everything. It's not money, yeah, it's money too. It's money, it's your time, it's your resources, it's your abilities. How generous. As we've come to Christ, 
And he's been so kind and generous to us that grace flows through us and we're generous to others. I don't know if you listen to Scott's prayer for the offering. I love the wording of the prayer. Because he says, it's not that, and I'm going to butcher this, Scott. It's not that we can ever give back of how generous you were to us. But we're just, we're giving as an example, and it's our way to express the same kind of generosity. That's a beautiful statement. It's why we give. That's why we're generous. We as a church uh, have committed, like this past year alone, $46,000 a year to missions. That's part of our budget. That's what we do is that we come together as a family, congregational rule, so we get together and we vote a budget in place, and as part of that, 46000 a year for missions. That's generous. That's kind. There's more that happens through that because that doesn't include all that you do, like with Operation Christmas Child, or you saw the note in the uh, bulletin that's a little shopping list for you. If you want to bring food for a local food pantry, we'll start collecting next week. That doesn't include that kind of generosity. But 46000 right off the bat, that's generous. Grace-filled are generous. Look at the next one, verse 14. And let our people learn to devote themselves to good works. Devote themselves to good works so as to help cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful. Boy, there's a lot of awareness in this passage. Devote themselves to good works. I want to remind us again, you and I can't do it. You can't be good enough. It's not talking about being good. It's about doing good. You can't do enough good. It's not just our inability. We don't even see it. So many times, needs go right past us, and we don't even see the need. We're dependent on God's grace and kindness in our lives. He's so fresh to us that he provides opportunity and vision to see the opportunity. He provides the ability to do things selflessly in the lives of others that truthfully we're like, "Ah, I know I could go help them, but I could watch another show on Netflix. It's getting good. I want to finish that. We have this battle all the time with our selflessness, selfishness and actually doing the good works. Andrew Murray was a a pastor, missionary, Scottish, passed away in 1917, kind of a famous missionary, a lot of wonderful books that he's left behind. Listen to what he said. He said, the deeper our conviction that we're saved, not by works but by grace, the deeper we understand that we are not saved by works, we're saved by grace, the stronger the proof we should give that we have indeed been saved by good works, not saved by good works. The more we understand the grace, the more there are good works. Because now it's not task, it's not obligation. It's His grace flowing through us. Let's talk for just a moment about what grace is. Grace is not actually like a thing. Grace represents things. So if I said that uh, Alinda here showed a lot of grace to Mike, that actually we don't know what, we have no idea what, what she did because it's not a thing. All I would know is that what Alinda did was gave some unearned, undeserved favor to Mike. 
That's what grace means. I don't know what it is. I'd have to ask. We're a grace-filled church. We're full of grace to our community. Actually doesn't say anything. I get the point. It means we're giving unearned, undeserved favor to our community. But I don't know what it is. That's why grace isn't actually a thing. It represents things. Be grace-filled on your sports team. You have to be. This sets you apart from everybody else on the team that you show unearned, undeserved favor to your sports team. But what? What is it? We'll go back to the source. God has given you an endless amount of grace unearned, undeserved favor from God to you. What is it? That's like the point. I get that I don't deserve it. I get that I didn't earn it. But what is it? You want to be grace-filled to your family, to your sports team, to your coworkers. What is it? Well, let's start where we get it. What is the grace, the unearned, undeserved favor of God? What has He lavished on you? I mean, soaked you, unearned, undeserved. What did He give you that's unearned and undeserved? Name some things. Love. Name some things. Eternal life. What's that? Another day. I I like that we could go, we go from eternal life and love to another day. And God's smiling right now. He's going, oh yeah, this is a fun game. Let's talk about all my unearned, undeserved favor upon you. He goes, yeah, keep going. You've just talked about a day, and you've talked about eternal life. What other things? Just yell some out. Good? Forgiveness? Health? Patience? Health is excellent. Mercy? Yeah, he didn't punish you when he could have, should have. Salvation? What was the other one? Holy Spirit? Wow, did we just get a deep bucket right there? Healing. Do you deserve a healing? Did you earn the healing? It was unearned, undeserved. It was grace in the form of healing. Okay, you named those. That's what we get. So when we open up our Bible in the morning and we sit there to read and you've got your daily bread or whatever you're going to use along with it as a supplement, you've got your Bible sitting open, and you're like, oh, this is what we're soaking in. You are so grace-filled to me. Uh, And it depends on your mood. It depends on what's going on in your life. It depends what's happened to you recently of what it is specifically that you appreciate the most about His grace because they're all true, right? But the fact that you said the one that you said so quickly says something about where you are in your life. Probably the one who said healing, there's a healing story probably behind that somewhere. That's fresh. If it's forgiveness, it's because you've gone through something and you kind of needed forgiveness. And so you specifically felt renewed and refreshed by his forgiveness. So that's why you said that one. It's his grace. We open up his word and we soak in. Yeah, we can say thank you for your grace. We pray for God's grace in your life. But let's be specific now and then. What exactly are you praying for in the life of a family member or a friend? Grace expressed how? 
What is it? How is it represented? This fourth one is, this fourth one can be trickier. Do I wish grace on others? For the one who's grace filled will desire grace in the lives of others. Uh, don't think just of your close family. Oh, you could think of family, but the troubled ones. It's unearned, undeserved favor. So it's the boss that's being rude. It's unearned, undeserved favor. You wish God's undeserved, unearned favor in the life of somebody. Yeah, it's somebody that's hurt you. It's somebody who is hurting you. It's not even past tense. It's not fair. The more grace you have, the more grace goes through you into the lives of other people. I'm always watching, and there's such wonderful examples of those that are standing in front of the courthouse at the end of a horrible case where somebody is convicted of taking a family member or something. And I'm always anxious to see what's going to be their takeaway. And there are some of the most beautiful stories as they stand there and say, I'm never going to get my son back because of what they did. And then all of a sudden they say it. But I forgive them. And I'm like, oh, how did they just do that? And it's really in their heart. I don't hold anything against them. I think they got what they deserved and they're going to be in prison the rest of their life, but I don't wish them evil. I don't wish them harm. How does somebody do that? How do you give unearned, undeserved grace? The only way is if you have it. If you received it, not once, because it doesn't last. It, it almost gets stale. It's like stagnant water in a stream. Don't drink the pool of water that's not moving, right? That's grace. It's that we're regularly going to God for His grace. And you're reading a psalm and a proverb and you're reading other sections and you're soaking it in and listening to it as His Word keeps fresh grace in you, then you have fresh grace going through you into the lives of people. Oh, it gets blocked. That one at the courthouse, she didn't come to that very quickly. She wanted to kill him. She wanted to track them down, just like the rest of us. But as the grace kept working in her life, she's able to finally say exactly what God says to us, which is, it's covered. It's okay grace sufficient. So out of all of his letters, out of all of his letters here in verse 15, it says, all who are with me send greetings. Greet those who love us in the faith. And here's that great phrase, grace be with you all. He is wishing grace upon them. Well, it turns out in Romans, the grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. First Corinthians, the grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. Second Corinthians, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, First Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians. First Timothy, Second Timothy, just flat out, grace be with you. Philemon, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Hebrews, whoever wrote Hebrews. Second Peter, it goes on and on outside of Paul's writings also, a constant wishing of grace into the lives of other people, okay? Sounds deep. We can be kind of graceless. We... We have a little tendency, don't we? Is it just me? In that email? 
Because at the computer, there's a distance, so it's cold. There's not a personality in front of us, so we can say things. How are you being received? How about people that we're, quote, enemies of? People that are ruining the country. People that are ruining things. Are we grace-filled? Are we showing grace to them? That's the distinguishing factor that you and I should have as we interact with people around us. Uh, Sarah and I, uh, I think we finally realized um, with three kids that we were going to end up having to buy, like, cars. It was hard enough that I had one and she had one. How many of you guys went through that same phase? (laughs) John, that was too fast. (laughs) John's like, I don't even want to talk about it. So it's one of the few times that we are glad our oldest wasn't going to drive. So he has saved us money by not driving. But Emma, so there's Emma, and she's, she's a nut. And we bought her, and this would have only been like eight years ago or something like that. We bought her a 1990 Ford Ranger. It's like one of those cars that you pick up and you go like that to get it to go. And then you set it down and it takes off. Anyone have one of those uh, Rangers? Yeah, those are amazing little cars. They now will fit in the back of like an F-150. I think you could just lift it and put it up in there. We had that car forever. It uh, got Emma going, and then Ross uh, was stuck driving it as well, and then somehow it came back to me, and I lost my car to the kids. I'm not sure how that happened. Every morning I'm driving to work in a Ford Ranger going, how did this just happen? Those old cars, and I don't know, I think it's more technical today, but they all have the same kind of bearings in the wheels. There's uh, little bearings that roll around, and it's actually, uh, again, they're a little different today, but back in the day, certainly, whether it's a Mercedes, a Ford Ranger, or a skateboard, they all had the same. It's these bearings. And the bearings need to be greased, and they need to work really smooth. And the smoother they work, the smoother it rolls. And again, whether it's a rolls or whether it's a skateboard, it's got to have that in there. Too often, we're running without the grease. It's the grace. We are so set on being right I just want to be right, and I know what's right, and we lead with the facts when we're supposed to lead with the grace. Let's not, let's not win. Win is I got to show unearned, undeserved favor. And let God sort the rest out. And we can only do that when we're spending time alone in God's Word through faith in Jesus Christ. It's all to that. It's actually very simple. You'd say, you know what, after the last 40 minutes, I'm half more confused about grace and Titus than when we started. And I'll say, oh, sorry about that. It's the best I can do. The good news is I could have cut the whole thing down to three minutes. You could have been home getting the Doritos out to watch the Browns beat the Steelers. You could be all ready for that. (laughs) Oh, really? Well, you guys beat us last, so it's just fair. Aren't we a give and take? Aren't we all friends? (laughs) No grace in football. That's where we draw the line. No grace in football. We could have actually summarized it this very simply. All these things that we need to do, we need to work as a team, and all of these signs and things that are grace-filled, the truth is we can say, let's just forget it. Forget all of that. Receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. Put your faith and trust in Him. His grace fills us. But it's not over. Daily the daily refreshment of His grace. And as that grace, it's a cleanser, it'll actually clean us. Remember, it teaches us to say no to ungodliness, literally, the grace does. It teaches us to say yes to good works. Just sit with His grace and allow His grace to work through us into the lives of other people. 
I could probably, like you, name people <clears throat> in this world that might need this, <laughs> but that's pretty graceless. But there's one person I know that needs it, and it's me. More grace coming into me so that more grace goes out of me. You know, you pray with me right now. It's quietness right now for just a moment. If you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior, it's there. It's not a church. It's not liturgy. It's not a program. He's a He. It's Jesus who died for you, for all of your sin. And faith in Him brings a relationship with God, the elimination of the sin. And if you've never received Him, I pray that you could you right now. Just pray these words silently between you and God. Heavenly Father, I need you. Thank you for dying for me. I trust you for eternal life. And the rest of us, we're simply asking, and I'm asking that we all would pray that more grace in our life from him and then more grace through us. Heavenly Father, we are asking that very thing. For those that trust you for eternal life, that they would grow in you, but the rest of us that we would all grow in more grace so that more grace flows through us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.